Hi everyone, for those of you who just joined, uh, we are just gonna give us a few more minutes um, and then we can get started. Um, and there might be a slight reordering of the talks. We might do the second talk last because we're still trying to locate the speaker. Um, and if any one of you uh, in the audience knows the speaker, maybe if, if you guys wanna ping him or her, that would be awesome. But uh, we'll we'll get going here in a in a minute or two. We have three talks, so we have plenty of time. Um, one of the things that um, I think we might do different as opposed to the other ones, uh, because we have time, we might allow questions through the mic. So if you have like some some questions uh, after the video ends then feel free to kind of, uh, yeah, ask them through the mic. I think we have plenty of time to do it this way. Uh, okay, do you want me to f uh, share the first video? Can, can we go on that or no, you, you want to wait still? Uh, I don't know whether you heard me or not. Um, I said, let's just start at 05. Okay, I think I think we can get going. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Omar. I am I'm uh, working at MSR currently in the database group. And today I'll be chairing the session uh, number 26, research session number 26 on modern hardware two. We have three talks in the session um, lined up. Um, so and and this is a 90 minute session. So we have plenty of time. Each video lasts about 15 minutes. So we have plenty of time for questions. Um, and for those of you who just joined, um, I was saying earlier that uh, because we have plenty of time at the end of uh, each talk, uh, feel free to kind of ask your questions through the mic. Um, I think that would uh, make the session much more interactive. Um, yeah, and, and other than that, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, unprecedented times. Yeah, I mean, we, everyone is kind of here experimenting and and kind of uh, experiencing this virtual conference uh, for the first time. So uh, I hope everybody is kind of staying safe, staying healthy, staying at home. Um, and and that, that still is the most important thing to do that we can do for like uh, to control this crisis right now. Um, but yeah, I mean, other than that, hopefully uh, everything is, uh, is, is, is going as people are getting used to work from home. I myself have kind of really gotten used to like, after being in quarantine for about a month and a half, it's starting to become uh, the new normal. So hopefully, I mean, it, it doesn't really become the new normal. Um, all right, so with that, let's, uh, let's get started with the first talk of the session, uh, which is gonna be presented by uh, Xu Hao Zhang. 
he recently graduated from the National University of Singapore, and he's actually now doing a postdoc at uh, TU Berlin with Professor uh, Volker Markel on stream data management in, in the space of IoT. And, and today he'll be uh, telling us about uh, a paper entitled Towards Concurrent Stateful Stream Processing on Multicore Processors. Arif, do you wanna launch the first video? Hello everyone, I'm Shu Hao. I'm going to present my very recent work on designing new system to support concurrent state for stream processing on multi-cores. This work was done when I was a PhD student at National University of Singapore Extra Computing Group, led by Professor Bing Zhenghe. Recent efforts have demonstrated ultra-fast stream processing on large-scale multi-core architectures. However, one weakness of today's system is the inadequate support of consistent stateful stream processing. What do I mean by that? Let me illustrate it with an example. Let's consider the toll processing query, which aims at computing toll of each vehicle based on the current road congestion status. In the figure, each circle denotes a stream operator and the H denotes a data flow among operators. Position report of each vehicle is continuously passed into the application. Road speed and vehicle count maintain an update road congestion status of different road segments. Toll notification computes the toll of each vehicle depends on the road congestion status. You may now notice that road congestion status is shared intuitively among different streaming operators. Consistent stateful stream processing requires such shared states to be maintained consistently. Let's now take a look how most existing systems handle it. Let's recall the common designs of stream system, including pipeline processing, with message passing, and on-demand data parallelism. That means each operator may be replicated into multiple instances or called executors, which are running concurrently. Then, to ensure consistency of the logically shared application state, developers often apply key-based stream partition so that each operator instance only maintain a disjoint subset of application states. In the next few slides, I will show you the limitation of this approach. Suppose there are two concurrent running executors, one for handling reports of row 1 and the other for handling position report of row 2. In this way, each executor only maintains either row 1 states or row 2 states, and there is no conflict among them. However, let's assume the processing of row 2 also need to reference the status of row 1. For example, we need to charge driver on row 2 higher if row 1 is empty. To achieve that, we have to either forecast the status of row 1 from executor 1 to executor 2, or we need to replicate reports of row 1 to executor 2 as well and maintain a replicate state of row 1 there. Obviously, both approaches are very costly, involving synchronization and extra communication overhead. So a key-based stream partition cannot efficiently handle such cases. An alternative is to let different executors to share states. In this example, both executors can be write to status of different roles. However, it may cause state inconsistency as they may concurrently read and write to the same state. Current solution rely on locks, where only one instance is allowed to acquire the lock, which ultimately leads to poor performance. 
Besides the issue of potential state access conflict, we also need to guarantee access order. For example, a toll should based on exactly current road condition. Otherwise, think about you are charged more of today simply because there were more serious road congestion yesterday, which makes no sense. Today, existing systems often achieve access ordering by using buffering and sorting, which is again obviously problematic. So how can we better handle it? Let's now review the state of art. Several pilot works propose to employ transactional semantics on managing shared states. So here, all operators and their executors are allowed to access shared table of records. And the state access is modeled as transaction. For example, at 10 a.m., there is one update to the count of unit vehicle on row 1. Five minutes later, there is a read to the count of row 1 to compute the toll. Subsequently, a correct schedule must ensure all state accesses are performed as if they are executed sequentially, according to their time step. Only this will ensure the status in read is up to date. Unfortunately, Power solutions explored very limited parallelism opportunities. This figure shows the result of using an existing partition-based approach on handling the toll processing query on multi-cores. As the number of cores used increases, the overhead of accessing shared states quickly dominates other operations due to serious log contention. Therefore, we need a new solution for scaling concurrent state access in the streaming system. We have built a new stream processing system called T-Stream to handle concurrent state for stream processing on modern multi-cores. In the following, I will discuss how we design the system. We introduce two designs to our system. First, the dual mode scheduling design aims at exposing parallel opportunities to the system. Second, the dynamic restructuring execution design aims at exporting the parallelism opportunities. Put them together, our system achieves up to 4.8 times higher throughput with similar or even lower processing latency compared to the state of art. We first abstract the process of one input invent as three steps. The pre-process step is for performing some initial process on the input in one, for example, filtering. State access is for accessing shared application states, for example, read to the road congestion status. Post-process is for performing other processes that depends on state access results, for example, computing the top. Under existing algorithms, these three steps are performed contiguously in one thread. However, state access is often the bottleneck. And it unnecessarily blocks all subsequent processes. We hence propose to decouple the process of it to be evaluated later. Let me illustrate with an example. Where we consider two executors running concurrently. In the beginning, each executor processes input ones without handling the state access requests. After a while, it pauses the handling of further input ones and starts to actually evaluate the postborn state transactions. Next, when postborn state transactions are fully processed, operators can start the post-process step. Finally, operators are resumed to process further input ones. Now you can see there are two modes, a compute mode and an access mode. 
these two modes are switched to each other periodically, controlled by punctuation signals. The advantage of this type of design is that it, it enlarges inter event parallel opportunities. As you can imagine, multiple state transactions from multiple events are going to be evaluated as a batch. The disadvantage of it is that it needs to handle on the fly events to ensure processing concurrentness. Please find the detail in our paper to see how we handle it. As state transaction process turns out to be a major performance bottleneck, we further propose a fine grained parallel approach to speed up the processing of postponed state transactions. The key idea is to decompose each state transaction into atomic operations and then regroup them to award complete before actual parallel evaluation is applied. In this example, Executor 1 decomposed transaction T1 into operation O1 and O2, and Executor 2 decomposes transaction T2 into operation O3, where operation 1 stands for read of row 1, operation 2 stands for update to row 2, and operation 3 stands for read of row 2. Those operations will be inserted into the so-called operation chain data structure, where operations in each chain target at the same application state, and they are automatically sorted according to their timestamp. Subsequently, when all transactions are decomposed and inserted into those operation chains, we can evaluate those operation chains in parallel without any state access conflict. I will now jump to experimental results. We use four applications in experiments, including gripsum, streaming ledger, online bidding, and toll processing. They cover different runtime characteristics, such as varying compute or state access ratio, different type of state transactions, such as read-only, write-only, different type data dependencies in the workload, where data dependency stands for, for example, a update to one state depends on a read of another state. They also cover different ratio of multi-partition transactions. We conduct the experiment on a full socket Intel Xeon server. We implement all state-of-art solutions in the same system, including log-based, multi-version log-based, partition-based, which is essentially the S-Door scheme. In addition, we also compare our solution with no consistency guarantee by removing logs from log scheme, which represents the performance upper bound of the system. Let's now see the overall performance comparison. There are three major observations. First, T-Stream significantly outperforms other consistent guarantee schemes at large core costs. Second, it still performs slightly better when data dependency is heavily presented. Finally, we need to note that there is still large room for further improvement as indicated by the no log scheme. Now let's do a recap. T-Stream adopts a non-conventional dual mode scheduling and transaction restructuring execution strategy for scaling consistent state for stream processing on multi cores. We have demonstrated that T-Stream performs constantly better than prior solutions. The arising Internet of Things or IoT are adding further pressure on current stream processing systems. I am now a postdoc in the team of Nebula Stream at TU Berlin, 
where we are building the next generation IoT data management platform, leading by Professor Walker Markov. There are many exciting open questions to remain to be solved. Stay tuned. If you have further questions, do not hesitate to contact me. Thank you. Okay, great. So this is typically where we kind of give you a round of applause. So I'll do that on behalf of the audience. Um, are there any questions? And as I was saying earlier, um, we're gonna we're gonna just allow people to ask questions through the mic. So if you have questions, just feel free at the moment. Uh, I have maybe I uh, sorry. Maybe I just uh, apologize first. Uh, it is uh, intention to. To play the music with the presentation because I saw it, since it's a virtual presentation, maybe very boring. So I just intended to add a music. But uh, uh, if it's very uh, noisy, uh, um, just apologize for that. That's okay. No worries. There was a question. Yes. Can people hear me? Yes. Okay. Great. Uh, so thanks for the talk. It was very interesting. Um, I was wondering how you handle situations where there are many conflicting transactions. So when basically uh, one, my one operator, or basically all operators all need to access the same stuff, then I don't have these nice parallel chains. Is that just the worst case where it's all serial and we don't parallelize anything? Uh, yes. Um, uh, when you say uh, conflicting transaction, there are two actually two cases uh, that is, can be very hard to the system performance. The first case is that one transaction actually depends on another, which is essentially the data dependency. If let's say I have a one in one that triggers one transaction, that trying to read something which is going to be depending on the results of a write from another transaction. This is uh, kind of difficult to, to solve. But currently, uh, our solution for this is to first uh, record the data relation between different transactions. In the, uh, in, by the time of uh, inserting those operations into the so-called operation chains, when we evaluate them, we will first evaluate those operations without any uh, data dependencies first. And then we evaluate those have dependencies on them. That's the first case. For the second second case is that uh, there is a, there are also cases where one one transaction uh, has to access multiple, for example, multiple data, uh, multiple tables. And for this, uh, TStream had handled it uh, very efficiently because we essentially in, in runtime time we decompose every transaction into atomic operations and insert into operation chains. Uh, and the also operation chains will be targeting at the same state. So there's no conflict among them. Does that answer your question? No, thanks. No, thanks. Are there other questions? We still have time. Okay, so while we wait for others, maybe I, I can ask a question here. So, so essentially, uh, in, in the evaluation uh, slide that you showed, um, you made a comment that there's still a lot of room for improvement over the no-lock approach, right? So can you share maybe high-level bits that you have in mind, what, what could be done further to close that gap? Yes. Uh, actually, we did uh, further profile, uh, profilation to study why, uh, where is the reason. There are actually two of them. Uh, the first is that although we have this kind of dual mode scheduling designs, there are still a lot of overhead between uh, during the model switch. So essentially, we need to switch from normal stream processing to the mode of uh, taking care of the postponed state transactions. The switch between these two modes will incur some synchronization overhead because we need to ensure um, we need to ensure at one uh, at one particular moment uh, when we switch to the state transaction execution mode, all in ones that arrives before it must have already inserted their operations or their transactions into the system. So some some of the threads have to wait for each other. This is one reason, and the second reason is because uh, when there is um, essentially a low lock, 
there's going to be a lot of uh, ca more cache efficient. When we handle it sequentially, there will actually result in many, many cache conflicts. I That's see. the two major reasons. Okay. And kind of a follow on to this. So um, are, you, are you currently planning to use this in, in, in your work at TU Berlin or how do you see this project going forward? Uh, good questions. Actually, uh, for this kind of transactional stream processing, my vision is that uh, eventually uh, um, to building a kind of data processing system, no matter in IoT or data center, you will eventually need some kind of deterministic or transactional state guarantee. And while I'm working on IoT database uh, kind of things, but uh, I believe transactional state uh, management guarantee will still be putting on. But the challenge is that uh, the current work is actually uh, mainly designed for shared memory. It is not designed for distributing uh, environment. So there might be a significant revisit mm -hmm. to in order to apply. Okay. I have a question about the memory management. So, I mean, did you ever have uh, a, a false sharing of the cache consistency for the NUMA systems? Uh, you mean the, you mean the, on the NUMA system, the cache? Uh, uh, yes, uh, this uh, false sharing issues in the NUMA uh, okay. systems. Uh, currently, we, our system uh, rely on JVM, so we kind of ignore that. We assume that the NUMA, uh, topology, uh, NUMA protocol will handle it for us. Any other questions before we move on? Going once, going twice. All right, gone. Thanks a lot. So let us move on to the next presentation in the session. Um, in the start, I said that we might reorder, but uh, it, it appears that now we can go in the order that was published on the website. So the, our next speaker is going to be Ji Yuan, uh, who is a PhD student at Car Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, her research focuses on high performance computing, hardware and software core, core designs. And today she'll be telling us about FISA, a fast and efficient set in intersection approach on modern CPUs. So RF, can we move on to the second video? Hi, I'm Jun. I'm a PhD student from Carnegie Mellon University. It's my pleasure today to present my work on FISIA, a fast and semi efficient set intersection approach on modern CPUs. An intersection is a functional primitive used by many applications from data query processing, social network analytics to recommendation system. For example, in the query processing, Data are usually organized as tables. The multiple keyword queries are therefore processed as the intersection between um, among those tables. In social network analytics, the network connections are usually organized as a set of network IDs. Finding all the common friends between different users and they are performed through the intersection between those neighborhood sets. Similarly, for the recommendation system, Serial section is used to compute the similarity scores among, among users. Given the fact that the serial section is underlying in so many different uh, important applications, therefore it is increasingly important to have a fast and efficient serial section implementations. Despite the rich literature on these topics, it still remains a challenging research problem on how to accelerate setting section on the evolving hardware. One reason, that, one reason is that the underlying hardware is evolving constantly. For example, nowadays, simultaneously, simultaneous instruction multiple data is the status quo for many modern CPUs. 
SMD features allows us to perform the operations on different elements at the same time. This drastically improves the compute capa capability of modern CPUs, but however, at the same time, it also poses the question of how to efficiently leverage in such computational resource. Over the years, we have observed that the SMD ways is becoming wider and wider from the 128-bit SSD instruction 10 years ago to nowadays we have the 5, uh, 512-bit AVX instruction set. This poses the challenge of how we should effectively leverage in the ever, ever evolving hardware resource to have uh, efficient set intersection implementation. One problem is most of the um, one problem with the existing uh, certain in, uh, one problem with some of the existing certain intersection approach is that some of the intersection approach are easily suited for some of the accelerations. Uh, such such approaches, their implementation contains a lot of branches. They may have so different data may fall onto different control flows uh, because they use a tree-based structure, or the computation of the, or if they use iteration-based approach, the iteration is by the the advancement of iteration is based on the output of previous iteration. Such irregular computation and um, control flow dependencies makes it hard to leverage the SMD resource on the modern hardware because it goes against the idea of some the, the, the regularity of SMD. On the other hand, a second problem is that many real-world applications will have small intersection size. For example, as they find out that um, over 90% of intersections of being search queries is an order of magnitude smaller than the size of the input sets. And the intersection size of over 70% of the queries is even two orders of magnitude smaller than the input size. And many of the existing intersection approach fail to take into these factors in their implementations. Given these two problems, we propose FISIA. FISIA is a fast and semi efficient set intersection approach on modern CPUs. It is able to it is able to address both of the, the both problems simultaneously. It is semi efficient. It is able to leverage SMD instructions on modern CPUs, and it is and it is port portable to different SMD widths from the 128-bit SSD instructions to the 256-bit AVX instruction. Secondly, it is also fast and uh, beneficial for real-world problems of in, with in a small intersection size. The, uh, the asymptotic complexity of our FISI approach is linearly related to the intersection size instead of the input size. Therefore, in, in many real-world problems, VCI can outperform many of the existing many of the existing setting section approaches, even though such approach also use factorization methods. No. And the high level um, our FISI approach is built upon a segmented bitmap data structure. The segmented bitmap data structure encodes the element of a set into a bitmap. Elements are mapped into the corresponding bucket in the map and are be put into a list. Bitmaps are grouped into segments, so is the list. The corresponding elements are therefore grouped, uh, in, uh, grouped and placed into the corresponding list segment. Alongside with the segmented bitmap, FISIA, we propose a two-step intersection algorithm. The first step, the intersection algorithm, performs a bitmap level intersection. This step leverage the bitmap to do a course level filtering, which can quickly eliminate the false intersections using the fast vectorized, vectorized uh, bit operations. 
specifically it compares the segmented bitmaps of the two sets and output the segment that intersects. In the second step, the second step is the segment level intersection. In this step, we go through the, the, the intersected segments are generated by the first step and apply our specialized vectorized intersection function to compute the final set intersection. Vectorizing the segment, segment level intersection. In order to vectorizing the segment intersection, we have proposed the following methods. Um, um, we apply uh, all pair comparisons that can leverage the, the SMD instructions on the existing CPU platforms to perform the intersection between two sets. For example, assume the vector lens uh, of our architecture is V. This, um, this approach goes like follows. It takes one element from list A and broadcasts this element across all the lens, across the entire lens of the SMD vector. Then performs element comparisons between list B and the result is going to be a zero one mask, which is going to be stored in, um, in, um, in a register vector. And then it and then it, it, it really applies the same broadcast compare procedure to the rest of the the rest element in list A and collects all the comparison results into V vectors and in the end combines the the comparison result together into one vector. And this resulting vector indicates the final or pair comparisons between the V vectors. And this gives the, this gives the idea of a generalized uh, uh, vectorizing um, uh, set intersection approach. However, in our, in our case, our segment size could be quite small compared to a generalized vector size. The size can be arbitrary. Therefore, applying a um, general vectorized intersection would incur unless many unnecessary overheads for in our case. There, specifically, there will be many redundant broadcast compares and, um, and, and arithmetic operations, which would cost unnecessary uh, timing times, time overheads. Therefore, we, we propose this we specialized our this we we specialized on the generalized vectorization kernels based on our segment size. The specialized kernel get rid of all the redundant broadcast compare and, and compare and arithmetic comparisons um, from the generalized kernel only does necessary computations that are, um, for the given segment size. To achieve the best performance, we have implemented and compiled set intersection kernels in advance for all possible scenarios. With all these intersection kernels, a runtime dispatch mechanism is therefore needed uh, because we want to get the, the correct intersection kernel for, the, for, the, for a given segment size. In order to achieve this, we compile and uh, collect or the starting address of all the intersection kernel functions, of the starting address of all the intersection kernel functions, and organize those starting address into a jump table. At the runtime, we get the size of the, the two lists that's going to be intersected and apply a simple arithmetic to compute a one control code. And then we use this control code as an index in to access the jump table to retrieve the function address to retrieve the starting address of the of the corresponding intersection function. This result shows the speed ups of our specialized intersection kernel compared with a generalized state intersection implementation. Um, we have performed experiments on uh, with three different machines, um, including 
The leftmost is the uh, speed up of specialized kernel on the SSE 128 bit instruction set. The middle ones are the speed ups of AVX 256 bit instruction set. The rightmost one is the speed ups of our in, uh, specialized kernel with AVX um, 512 um, intersection kernels. You can see from this graph that for SSE kernels, our specialized kernel can achieve up to 70% faster than the generalized main section kernels. And for the AVX 512 kernels, we can obtain up to six, six faster than the general intersection uh, implementation. And the, we, we can say that uh, uh, our specialized kernel is faster than the generalized special uh, intersection kernel in all cases. And the larger and the, the wider the SMD weights, the more speed ups we can get. This graph shows the speed ups of our, um, the speed up or our, our PCI approach, intersection approach um, on two different machines with varying um, intersection size. Um, the left graph shows um, the uh, performance speed up on uh, Intel Haspel machines and the right one shows um, the performance speed up on uh, Intel Skylake machines. We can see from these two graphs that our SSE and AVX implementation can achieve up to seven times speed up compared to a, a scalar intersection methods. And we can obtain um, 1.6 times to three times speed ups compared to uh, other state of art SMD intersection methods. And we have also presented uh, our method speed up over some real world data sets. The upper graph shows our speed up on the, um, on the, uh, over some real world query data sets. The data set is a uh, web, web, doc, uh, web doc document, uh, document data set. The left shows if we perform the intersection over, if we perform k-way intersection, where the k equals two and the k equals two, three. The right graph shows the speed up of our FISIA methods uh, compared to other state-of-art some of the uh, vectorization methods when the, when the two sets have a different size. And we can say that um, our FISIA uh, method um, can achieve up to four times speed ups on the real world query data set. The lower graph shows our FISIA speed up um, um, on a social network analytic task. The task is a triangle counting, which is, which is a task that's widely used in many pattern recognition or um, clustering, um, clustering analytic tasks. And the data set was, uh, we gave a three representative data set from the snap, the snap graph data set. And we can say that our FISDIA method compared to the state of our SMD method, we can achieve up to over, we can achieve over 10 times speed up than the state of our SMD methods. And our FISDIA methods can scale, scale well with increasing number of cores um, so that is the end of our talk, and we, we welcome questions and uh, suggestions. Thanks. All right, great. So great talk, you all. Um, so now we have time for questions, and those of you who just joined, um, we are doing questions over the mic. So you please feel free to unmute yourself and ask the questions. Anyone? Okay, I, so while uh, we wait, oh, yeah, yeah, Brad, go ahead. So I was, thanks for the interesting talk, first of all. Um, I wonder, are there cases where it doesn't make sense to use these kind of SIMD extensions to do set intersection? Like, for example, if you don't have 
a large amount of data that you need to intersect, would it be better to prefer the scalar methods instead? Could you comment on when it makes sense to use these techniques? Uh, yes. Um, uh, so, yeah, um, uh, that's a very good question. Um, so, um, which method to use or wh whether it makes sense to use uh, such intersection methods highly depends on the data sets. So for some, um, depends on the, so many factors would depend on the methods you will use for intersection. For example, um, the sparsity or density of your input data set, the size of your input data set, and the skewness of your input data set. All those factors would, uh, would um, affect the method you would like to use for intersection. Um, uh, for example, uh, if your um, two sets, uh, both of the, both of the cells are quite small, then it doesn't make sense to use the uh, vectorized methods. Um, but it also like uh, in our paper, our specialized intersection methods, can, uh, the, the specialized intersection kernels can also help with such uh, small size intersections. Um, in other case, if the, if the size of the two lists are dramatically different from each other, for example, there is a huge skewness uh, some other binary search-based uh, intersection methods or tree-based intersection methods may be better in such case. So um, yes, uh, that's a so that's a good question. So the intersection methods highly depends on the input data. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? Um, yeah, while we wait for others to kind of speak up, maybe I can ask a question. So, so I think this is kind of um, uh, related to the question that uh, Brad just asked. Um, what are the practicalities like? I mean, if I'm if I'm kind of wanting to take this approach and put this in in in, uh, in a real use case, like what would be the challenges that I'd be facing? Right? Are the instructions uh, um, kind of mainstream at the moment and things like these where Sometimes one approach works and other times other approach works depending on like skewness and your instruction set sizes and so on and so forth. How do you how do you envision this to kind of become be used in like reality in practice? Yeah, so I think in practice um, we should um, uh, should choose the proper uh, uh, strategy based on the application. Uh, for example, uh, if we are dealing with um, query query data sets. Um, uh, so we know that uh, the intersection size of query data sets is usually small. And um, the size of the query list are usually big. So um, approach like uh, ours would make sense. Um, but uh, if we are dealing with some uh, social network analytics tasks, uh, like some graph, um, graph social network data sets, uh, so the skewness uh, will be a problem, and um, we would uh, so it's better we have um, also some methods that could uh, deal with skewness of the data set, and we can dispatch and choose the correct one. And for our methods, uh, we have shown paper that uh, we were able to deal with both situations, like when the data set is skewed, and also when the data set size intersection size is small. So basically, so our method can cover um, a, a wide range of uh, corner case. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions before we move on? All right, let's thank the speaker once again. I'll do that on behalf of everybody. Thanks a lot for your talk. Um, Thanks. Let's move on to the next one. So next speaker, which is um, next talk, which is last in today's session, will be presented by Philippe Fant. He's a PhD student at Technical University of Munich. He works on improving the database system Umbra with a focus on network communications. And today he'll be telling us about low latency communication for fast DBMS using RDMA and shared memory.
My name is Philipp Fendt and I'm a PhD student at the Databases Group at the Technical University of Munich. Today I'll present our work on low latency communication for database systems. Communication performance is essential for fast transaction processing. First, I'd like to briefly go over how a database system communicates with its clients. When sending a message to a client, the database system first encodes any data in its specific serialization format, like the Postgres or MySQL protocol. Then it is wrapped into a network and transport protocol. This is usually TCP IP. Afterwards, the data is sent to the client over a physical connection, let's say gigabit ethernet. On the client side, the message then traverses the stack in reverse order until it reaches the application. This communication stack is usually wrapped up as an ODBC driver and an interface at the database side. Or in Java land, this might also be a JDBC driver. In our work, we identified that inside this ODBC stack, the data serialization and the physical interconnect only have a minor impact on communication performance. But the network and transport protocol, so the middle layer here, significantly bottlenecks OLTP performance. Luckily for us, this is an internal component of our ODBC stack, so we're actually able to swap it out without changing the external APIs, but we might need to upgrade the network card so it works with our RDMA implementation. Let's put this bottleneck into numbers with a benchmark. For this, we extend the memory database, the in-memory database system silo with network capabilities and measure it using the TPCC benchmark. The results of this benchmark look like this. With a single thread, a silo can process almost 60,000 transactions per second. But this is only measured in a closed loop and in process, which is really impractical for a real application. When we instead drive the benchmark with an external process and also include the communication overhead over a standard Linux socket, Silo's performance drops to a few thousand transactions per second. Both Unix domain sockets and TCP are over a factor of 20 slower than the in-process benchmark. This is of course completely unacceptable. We are effectively giving up 95% of our performance. And I'd like to point out that this is measured on localhost, so this performance drop is definitely not caused by any actual network overhead. Even when using more threads, here eight threads that operate on the same database, the overall picture is unchanged. On that point, let me first clear up the common misconception that the network is just too slow. This is certainly not the case for transaction processing, where the latency is really what matters. Modern network equipment has a latency of a couple of microseconds, which corresponds to around 100,000 instead of 1,000 transactions per second. So it should be fast enough for silo. We actually have a twofold other bottleneck. The first point is that TCP IP is unnecessarily complex but it is still widely used since it is the standard for reliable network communication. For example, TCP deals with many problems that arise from routing data across the globe, but for database communication, the connections are usually between systems that are very close to another. They might even be on the same machine. And when we're still using TCP here, that's just a huge waste of resources. So, Replacing TCP IP when possible can already double the performance, but we're actually looking for an improvement of an order of magnitude. So we need to look further. The second bottleneck we face is through kernel communication, which requires expensive system calls to send messages. When sending a message from database to the client, we first write the message to a socket which causes a first context switch to the kernel. Then the kernel wakes up the client that wants to read the next message, again causing a context switch. This whole process easily takes longer than the whole transaction inside of the database. 
the system call boundary also isn't going to get any faster anytime soon, but system calls got even slower in the recent years, which was caused by the whole Intel meltdown disaster. However, only using user-space networking alone, so completely leaving out the kernel, but still relying on TCP, only gives around 20% latency improvement. To actually get performance that is suitable for a fast database system, we need to eliminate both of these bottlenecks. What we instead propose is communication based on direct memory access. Here, you can see a local implementation where we set up a shared message buffer using the kernel once, here with mmap. Then the messages can be directly accessed with memcopy and almost no overhead. In our approach, we wrapped this concept in a small open source library to which we will provide a link on the last slide. So for this case, when both the database and the client application are co-hosted on the same machine, we implement the message buffer using shared memory, as you just saw on the last slide. This way, we can get a latency similar to an in-process database system like SQLite, but without all the downsides where you can actually accidentally corrupt the database. Shared memory is also the ideal interconnect for a scale-up with a containerized Docker environment. Connection establishment directly over shared memory can be a little bit tricky, so we bootstrap our connection with a regular Unix domain socket. During protocol negotiation, we then upgrade the connection to our own message buffer. This works by passing the shared memory file descriptor over the domain socket. Then we mmap the message buffer as a ring buffer into the private memory address space of the database. We also fine-tuned the message buffer for available bandwidth, which depends on the two transmission parameters we plotted here. On the x-axis, we vary the size of the individual chunks in a bigger transmission in bulk. On the y-axis, we vary the size of the message buffer. On this machine here we that we run the benchmark on, the optimal configuration is a one megabyte buffer to which we write individual chunks of 128 kilobytes of data. So the receiver process can process those chunks while the sender writes the next one. As a general recommendation here, we can see the two boundaries in the heat map that are caused by the L2 and L3 cache. So in general, we want a message buffer that fits into L3 cache and transmits chunks that fit into L2 cache. For remote machines reachable over the network, we use the same concept using remote direct memory access, RDMA. This is a possibility for many co-located servers in the same data center with special network interface cards. In our setup, we used an InfiniBand network, but several cheaper option, options using Rocky, RDMA over converged Ethernet exist. And several cloud providers also host RDMA capable instances. From a performance perspective, RDMA is quite similar to shared memory. However, for RDMA, we need to bootstrap the connection via a regular TCP IP connection to exchange the RDMA identifiers. For the remote direct memory access, we set up a ring buffer that is very similar to that in shared memory. However, RDMA in itself is rather complex. One thing we looked at is the primitives to transfer data from buffer to buffer. In this graph, you can see the performance when transmitting messages of increasing size on the x-axis. And we compare different commands. The two approaches at the top use single-sided commands exclusively, where the remote system doesn't need to interact with its network card to receive data. Instead, the single-sided commands directly write the incoming data to memory. On the receiving side, we then just pull this memory to observe any new incoming messages. The two lower commands are two-sided, which is more flexible, but at the cost of around 70% performance. Two-sided commands can be used to implement indirect writes, 
where we need some additional information where to store the incoming data. We also benchmarked an implementation of indirect writes, which we wrote on our own that we used to scale polling to many clients. But again, one-sided operations have significantly less latency, even when we use two writes and we double the number of RDMA writes, which is a trade-off we're willing to make. So for RDMA, we completely rely on one-sided operations since they are the fastest for our use case. Scaling to many clients poses another problem. Since we have an asymmetric number of connections with many clients connecting to the same server, we use a different message buffer strategy for messages from the client to the server than for the reverse. Polling hundreds of message buffers on the server would cause cache thrashing due to many random accesses. Instead, we use a cache efficient mailbox. Every time we send a message to the server, we remotely write a one byte flag to that mailbox that indicates a new incoming message. Here, we also use one of the ordering guarantees of RDMA. When we issue two writes after another, they are sequenced correctly. This means that the mailbox flag is only written after the message was completely written into the message buffer. Since the mailbox is laid out continuous in memory, this allows a very efficient polling even with many open connections. For 200 open connections, we measure the polling overhead of around 5%. Unfortunately, reliable RDMA connections, which we use here, don't scale indefinitely, since the network card itself needs a certain amount of network card memory for each open connection. With this mailbox approach, we can scale right up to this limit, but then we need to demote some connections to plain TCP IP. Unreliable RDMA message transmission might be more scalable to a lot more connections, but we actually don't think they are an appropriate alternative for a reliable database system. In result, for the key value lookup benchmark YCSB C, our implementation brings a performance improvement of over an order of magnitude. While other systems also have a shared memory connection on Windows, these do not bring the same performance improvement. We decided to investigate the strange behavior of MySQL since we expected to see a much more significant increase in performance using shared memory. MySQL actually uses shared memory to transfer data, but it still uses the Windows Kernel Events API to get notified about incoming messages, which just nullifies the potential latency improvements. On a side note, Silo now outperforms SQLite even when communicating with a separate process. For remote measurements, we also get an order of magnitude more throughput. However, we didn't come across any system as a competitor that already uses RDMA to exchange transactions. When scaling up the number of clients that connect to each server, our system also scales quite well. Here, I want to point out that even four clients that connect over RDMA can saturate a single threaded silo server. Using regular TCP, this only happens with around 100 clients. With fewer TCP clients, we can't even generate enough load for the need to scale up the number of server threads. So to conclude this presentation, we provide our implementation as an open source library. It is named L5, the low level, low latency library, which you can find on GitHub. With L5, we can use shared memory and RDMA to actually bring the transaction pro processing performance of in-memory database systems to its clients. To get back to the TPCC benchmark from earlier, we get performance improvements of over an order of magnitude. For any questions, you can write me an email to fent at in.tum.de. And if you're following ICDE live, I should also be available for Q&A right now.
Awesome. Thanks a lot for the great talk. Um, we have a lot of time for questions, actually. So, um, and again, people who join late, we are doing uh, we are doing interactive Q and A here. So, feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions. Uh, hey, I have a question. Um, so, first of all, again, thanks for the talk. Uh, really interesting. So, on as uh, I, maybe I just didn't understand this fully. On slide eight, you were showing this mailbox uh, concept. Uh, mm -hmm. I was wondering, how do you guarantee that two clients don't write to the same memory address? Because if you're appending sequentially, I just didn't quite understand how they know where to write to. Oh, um, we, we exchanged uh, the position where the client should write to um, in, in the connection process. So if a, if a client wants to write multiple things, they have to always reconnect again? Um, th or they can they can write the message. As, they can just write a, a longer message, or yeah. uh, they need to wait until um, the, the first message is completely processed. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, actually, I have a question. Um, in one of your slides, you show different uh, configuration for using the RMA. And in particular, I, show, I, I, I saw that the one co particular configuration, the right plus polling, actually dominate all other configurations. Is that always true, or it just happens to your workload? Um, this is uh, for this workload, because this is really latency dependent. So, so what we did is that, um, each subsequent write um, actually depends on, on, on the previous write. So um, we, this is for especially latency bound applications. Um, uh, as I said in a couple of, uh, uh, I think in, in one of the later slides, um, the send operations might scale to a lot more clients and might also be scalable to um, a lot more concurrent messages. But uh, unfortunately, they have about double the latency than a write with polling. Uh, just a follow up, is it possible to switch different configurations in the middle of the process? Probably yes, but I haven't, um, I haven't implemented it. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, other questions? We still have a lot of time. I have a question about the interface for how this shared memory port would work. Does it affect mm -hmm. the way that you would have to interact with the remote database? For example, I imagine, or does this follow under the POSIX API for send receive, or do I have to go and implement something completely different? Like it doesn't really wrap it well. It, it is similar to the POSIX interface, but um, so I tried to imitate the POSIX interface as, as, as much as I could. But um, so, so it, it of course is an engineering um, task to, to integrate it, but I, I think it's a reasonable um, work compared to another uh, connection. Okay, thanks. So while we wait, um, so this library is this is this already open source? Yes, this is on GitHub. This is on GitHub. So uh, could you could you say maybe in a, in in a, in a short uh, summary that if kind of I am I am a database developer and so so you basically integrated this with Silo as an example, right? Yes, exactly. So could you say uh, how much effort is needed to kind of use this library in, in kind of, uh, if today I decide to integrate it with like MySQL or, or I don't know, SQL Server, uh, like, I mean, how hard or easy would it be to do that? So like for me, it took about a, a week to integrate it into Silo, but um, uh, I know this library 
because I've written it. So um, it was like 2,000 or 3,000 lines of code. So um, that, that shouldn't be too hard. And Silo didn't have a network interface before. So that I don't, I don't think it's uh, too hard to integrate it. OK. And a related question is like, where, where do you see this going? Like, you've done all this work. You have made it open source. Like, I mean, what are your aspirations for this work going forward? Um, like in the in the medium future, I want to integrate it into uh, into our database system, Umbra. I uh, this didn't have a network interface until recently, and there's uh, that's what I'm currently working on. And uh, I might also come around to implement uh, this uh, low latency communication into Umbra. Okay. Are there other questions? All right, so I guess with that, uh, thanks a lot once again, Philip, uh, for the great talk and, and, and the Q&A. And, &A. and uh, everyone else, this kind of concludes our last session of the conference, I guess. <laughs> uh, everybody stay safe, stay healthy, stay indoors, um, uh, and, and if, and um, and I think tomorrow we have this last one in the workshop, um, Women in Data Science. So do check that out. Uh, it should be quite exciting. Um, and with that, I think we can conclude the session. So thanks once again to all the speakers and all the, all the people who have kind of helped this uh, put together. It actually went a lot better than, I mean, this is my first time running a virtual uh, session and uh, I think everything just went perfect. So, so thanks a lot for uh, to all the speakers and all the volunteers. All right, we can stop the recording now, Arif, and uh, people can start leaving. I guess. Take care. Bye.